Motor vehicle collisions with wildlife in Wyoming had become a huge and gruesome problem as the 21st century arrived. Then a group of Wyoming forward-thinking leaders, including our guest today, decided to do something about it. We'll speak with Nate Brown of the Wildlife Fund. I'm Steve Peck of Wyoming PBS. This is Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. We're joined today by Nate Brown, who's the operations manager for Wildlife Fund. Nate, I want to talk about Wildlife Fund and what your extremely diverse and busy job is. But first, the obvious question is, what is this thing behind you here that uh, we're looking at? Steve, that's a, that's a wildlife highway crossing or a wildlife overpass. It looks like a big tunnel that's been constructed there, but it's actually a bridge. It is. Why is it there? So typically these are created to reconstruct an old migration corridor or ridge line that wildlife used to cross over this area and go back and forth between their summer range and their winter range. Steve. We're here now north of Pinedale, yep. south of Jackson, and this entire uh, mini region here of 20, 30, 40, 50 miles perhaps, maybe more than that, is actually at the, uh, the center of the wildlife crossing uh, effort really nationwide, is that fair to say? Wyoming is leading the charge with regard to wildlife crossings. It's safe to say that in Wyoming it's driven um, driven by research more than anything. Uh, Tell us about that. I mean, there are numbers that told people in Wyoming who care about not just wildlife but highway safety as well that this would be a good idea. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of research being done for years and years with regard to migration in Wyoming. Um, anyone from Wyoming obviously knows that big game animals uh, migrate constantly in Wyoming. It's, uh, you know, it's very challenging for, for food sources particularly, um, getting from summer range to winter range. And so, uh, you know, the University of Wyoming, the Haub School, uh, folks like the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, the Wyoming Migration Initiative, um, all of those folks have been doing a lot of research for a lot of years and they, we've known about migration, but now it's backed by GIS data, collaring information. There's all sorts of technology that's added to this, Steve. There are a couple of these in Wyoming now, and they've emerged over the past 10 years or so, and it's a new and uh, bold way to solve what is known to be a big problem in Wyoming. What, who uses that, that, that uh, structure? Steve, it was basically designed for large ungulates to use. Um, it's also used by cattle. This particular one um, is in an area where there's cattle that get driven back and forth and, and across this area. But the main focus of it was the large ungulates, yeah. pronghorn and mule deer primarily, here at Trappers Point by Daniels Junction near Pinedale, Wyoming. Yeah. That's a classic spot. This is in the, pr the path of the pronghorn. Um, these were, you know, no, it was a notable spot for pronghorn and mule deer fatalities. So it's good for the wildlife because this is where they live. They were here before us. They know already they have to cross the road. They have to get from there to there. Yeah. They can't help it. Yeah, and it's actually, you know, it's ingrained in their yeah. very existence. It's, They've been doing it for centuries. It's an instinct for them to go to where the food is at a particular time of year. Yeah. So now we put this road in between and it's caused them a problem, Yeah. the animals, it's caused the people a problem because there are thousands, I'm not sure people understand this, thousands of wildlife automobile collisions. Yeah, wildlife vehicle collisions yeah. are, uh, are you know, very common in our state. I think one of the earliest memories I have is a member of my own family when I was very young was yeah. killed in a rollover vehicle accident. In the so. case of the of the person you mentioned, this was someone who had swerved to avoid yep. a pronghorn antelope on yep. the road. Rolled the car, the spare tire, you know, killed my cousin. And and like I said, it's uh, one of my earliest memories. And I think that anyone in the state of Wyoming that's lived here very long 
if they think about it, they probably know someone, Steve, that's been down that road or had a family member or friend lost to a vehicle collision with you know, likely a, you know, a large ungulate. The data that uh, has been collected showed some gruesome numbers. Yeah, correct? yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, 6,000 is, is an average low end number. That's basically a number of total animals retrieved from the highway crossing area where, you know, the actual right of way mm -hmm. for YDOT occurs. And so, um, the, you know, the YDOT guys, they're always constantly cleaning up these roadways so people don't see this carnage. But what people don't realize is there's a lot of animals that have been impacted by cars that get off of the right of way out into the sagebrush. They're either killed by predators as a result of their injury or they have a slow lingering death as a result of an injury. Those animals are never counted. Um, there's, there's estimates as high as, as four times the 6,000 average number that we, we go off of now. So nobody really knows because that's data that's hard to gather. Well, you told capture. your story. Mine story is not nearly as bad as that, but I've hit a deer twice in my life. Both times it was at night, both times on a narrow, a two lane road. I spun the deer around both times and it vanished. Yep. It wasn't dead on the highway, but I was impacted by a car at speed. I slowed down, slammed on the brakes, but I thought, well, I wonder if that deer is going to make it. Yeah. And what you're telling me and what, what I think we know is it very well might not have. There's definitely a large, a large volume sure. of those animals that definitely don't make it. So the wildlife deaths and injuries is part of it, but there's also property damage concerns beginning with automobiles, right? Yeah. And the, and the impacted fence lines along the edges of the road, property damage that cars end up hitting, um, you know, the deer that end up flying and damaging someone else's car that's in the un oncoming lane. Uh, those, those are actually around $50 million a year annually just in our state alone. So that led uh, smart minds to think about ways to do this. But why don't we just lower the speed limit? Why don't we just put rumble strips in? Why don't we just put flashing lights in? Won't, won't that they've solve tried, this They've problem? tried it all, Steve. They've tried literally all of it. And you know, another thing I want to touch on is as modern technology, cell phones are absolutely another issue. You know, we're all distracted nowadays from our, our driving, you know. The reality of it is, is it plays a part in this as well. People just aren't as attentive on the roadways as they used to be, and then they're driving faster, the roads are, are better. Um, it's a long ways from point A to point B in Wyoming, Steve, and so, um, you know, that's kind of a typical problem as well. So, these other things were tried. They were effective partially. But then the idea comes along to do something big. And I hope it shows up on camera. This is the first time I've ever seen it in person. It's big and it's designed to just keep as many animals as possible from even having to face the decision yep. of crossing the road because they can cross there. Who came up with this, do you know? I'm not exactly sure who you could give um, credit to that initial concept. I think, you know, we've been using overpasses for our own personal reasons, you know, for vehicle reasons for years and years, I think it only makes sense to people. But one of the, you know, the challenges, and that's where the wildlife fund comes in is, is how do you talk people into funding these kinds of things? They don't really see the value in it unless they've actually exper experienced, you know, a motor vehicle collision themselves or wildlife um, vehicle collision. So it's one of those things that um, unless you're really doing the research and digging into it, um, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And we're all apathetic. That's another thing that's kind of an interesting thing. I think, you know, you see, I alluded to YDOT doing a great job of cleaning the carnage up along the road. I think the case could be made that it would be more impactful if you left it there. Nobody'd like it. It would obviously create other issues and, and not be safe. And a lot of, you know, raptors and large birds of prey would suffer as a consequence of that. But, you know, the idea that we remove them out of our sight definitely doesn't help make the cause. Right? Interesting point. Wildlife Fund is not the Game and Fish Department. No. It's not the Wildlife Federation. It's not the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But you have uh, uh, interaction with many different agencies. How would you describe what Wildlife Fund is? You know, we're a partner foundation to the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. We were created by the commission and the department in 2019 to serve a, a unique role in funding projects like this and, and just being free and easy 
with with regard to, to funding. People can dedicate funds to a specific project. If this is your end game and this is what you like, if it resonates with you, you can dedicate all your funding and take advantage of a 501c3 tax deduction um, and still fall within the strategic vision of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. When you're talking about funds like this, there's simply no way that the state is going to be able to budget for it. That's exactly correct. But you find, Wildlife Fund finds, that there are people who would want to help pay for it, individuals, foundations, other entities, yep. but you have to have the mechanism so that it can get from them to the project. This is what Wildlife Fund can do. That's really the whole impetus and the whole, the whole reason for the Wildlife Fund is, is to facilitate partnerships for impactful things that you know, help our wildlife in the state. And, you know, that's what it is. I mean, people generally don't like to fund government organizations anyway. You know, they, they feel like, you know, it's always an issue. They don't know where their money's going. We have a 90-10 uh, model. So 90% of every dollar that's donated to the Wildlife Fund goes straight to projects. That was my next question. No one can accuse Wildlife <laughs> Fund of being this big bloated bureaucracy, right? There's you and one other person. <laughs> that's right. We have two employees that are full-time, an entire volunteer board. Yeah, Chris McBarnes, the president, is, is the first employee. He's been um, doing a great job. Um, I actually was out of state for several years. I'm a Fremont County, Wyoming native. Um, as many people know, um, it's a challenging to make a living in Wyoming. And I went elsewhere for a while, but I can say that, you know, one thing that's unmistakable is Wyoming brings you home, Steve. And I, you know, I found a, a home with the Wildlife Fund and, and that's what I honestly believe, you know, is the main reason why I took this job. And I can say that is, is it's a home for everyone who loves wildlife. And that crosses a broad gamut of people, of types of people, yeah. of philosophies that people have. Wildlife can be a unifier. Are you finding that? Absolutely true. And I think it's long, long awaited. I mean, I think you know, it's a polarizing subject. Wildlife is polarizing. You have, you know, long term heritage folks from Wyoming who've um, subsisted off of wild game. Uh, you have ranchers who have fed wild game and, and, you know, kept them on their place all their lives. And, and sometimes that's troublesome. They're eating their haystacks. You know, the Department of Game and Fish has to deal with those issues all the time on a daily basis. So uh, what's neat about the Wildlife Fund is all folks from all different walks of life, energy industries, um, all, all, all encompassing every, every type of energy industry, um, you name it, business entities, recreational businesses, tourism businesses, um, private groups, private ranches, private, you know, um, partnerships Cons across the state, you know, well. family trusts. Knobloch has been a huge funder of these. I'd, I'd like to, you know, bring them out. Um, you know, those are the kind of folks that have noticed that the Wildlife Fund is the kind of, of organization and the type of organization that's inclusive of all ideas and concepts. It's not that we're, you know, not that we're definitely, you know, we're still within the strategic vision of the Wyoming Game and Fish. But we, we listen to everybody, anyone who has an interest in conserving wildlife habitat and uh, funding research for wildlife can have a home with the Wildlife Fund. Well, this, this particular area, Steve, is actually designed to funnel cattle to the crossing. Okay. Yeah, and also exclude wildlife at the same time. So you can see the, the shorter fence here and then the taller fence on the perimeter of the actual easement. Um, the whole idea is to keep the wildlife that are typically out in the wide open space off of this highway area. Okay. But this is particular to the cattle driveway and a multi-use and multi-use concept that all of these organizations are working together to make happen. So it allows the guys that, that run cattle on public land to have a place to funnel these cattle up onto the crossing and then safely across the same roadway that we're concerned with wildlife. So, so there's no, it's not cattle drive season yet, but it will be. Absolutely. And there are times when people coming by here might see hundreds and hundreds of uh, head of cattle walking right where we are. Absolutely, Steve. So before the crossing was here, what did they have to do? The typical deal is you set up flaggers on both ends and, and say a Hail Mary and hope for the best and try to get them across the highway. Was that part of the planning of the wildlife crossing originally? Did the, did the, the concept include realization that could be used this way? Yeah, absolutely, Steve. And I think, you know, one thing that the Wildlife Fund and the Game and Fish have done a good job of 
is recognizing the role that ranching plays in wildlife conservation. Um, sometimes that's not necessarily the rancher's choice, but large expansive open spaces are what it takes to winter wildlife and for wildlife to have successful feed um, to make it through Wyoming's harsh winter. So uh, the ranching community plays a huge role in that. So it'll, it only makes sense that we partner with them and accommodate them in any way that we can to try to help make this work for everybody. How then do the, the, does the wildlife itself needing to cross get to the bridge, so to speak? So these are classic migration corridors to begin with. So that's where the habitat uh, biologists of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and those folks have, you know, and they've been the fish and wildlife in certain places, in certain cases. They know that they want to generally come this way anyway. As you can see, this is a large ridge between Daniel and between Bondurant, that's kind of general area. So um, this is a corridor that we basically essentially just put back. It was, all, it was always here until we bisected it with this highway. So we've just kind of put it back. But as you can see on both sides, um, these lower fences that are more like the size of your typical cattle fence, they also have a high uh, a pole on the top, a horizontal pole on the top to make them more visible to cattle or to wildlife. And then after the cattle have grazed and been trailed through here, then these gates are generally left open as well. So the whole idea is to kind of funnel the wildlife naturally in a, in a corridor that they're already used to using and have been over you know generations have learned to use and then allow them a safe passage across this highway. The horizontals on the top rail of the fence are generally much more easily seen by wildlife and one of the things that happens as, as we went through this past winter obviously is, is you have three or four feet of snow most of that fence is covered up and so um, imagine trying to jump out of a swimming pool I use that example for people sometimes and you suddenly know, it's stand in you know four feet of water and see how high you can jump right so that's what they're encountering when there's a lot of snow uh, that top rail gives them a visual aid to help them see where they need to, to reach to get over safely but you know the point is is to to utilize it for cattle when that's done prior to the big migration push in november that starts mostly in november um, then those gates will be actually opened up and tied back to allow safe passage and easier passage. And you said this was could be a $35 million project? That was the uh, the cost of the entire US 189 highway crossing project, was all, which also included these the exclusionary fencing, the jump out structures. But we're talk, comparing that to an annual property damage of cost million. of $50 million just for one year. Yeah, yeah. So there's some bang for the buck here. Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, we're not even putting a price on the, you know, or a value there. It's easy to put a price on wildlife because we know what our, our license costs are. We know what those, you know, the revenue that hunting and fishing brings to our state. Those are all tangible things that they get measured pretty often. But, you know, how much is one person worth, you know? that dies on one of these spots. I mean, that's, that's a, when you, when you throw that into it, then it really, it really kind of evens that. Can't be calculated. Yeah, it can't be calculated at all, so. Protection of wildlife is a big term that can yeah. cover, that does cover lots and lots and lots of things. In beginning or including keeping so many of them from being struck and killed by cars. It's a never ending topic and Wyoming's perfect for it. It is, and this is a classic example too, Steve, of different end users having impacts on wildlife. The folks traveling this highway, many of them probably never have hunted before, you know, but they we're basically bringing this idea to the nation's attention um, and showing that this actually absolutely has an impact. All of this traffic also has an impact on wildlife, and so this is a, a great way for multiple groups of people across all different you know thought processes all different ideas to be involved in helping protect a resource for there's all. no question that these some of these vehicles we're seeing are on their way to or from grand teton national park yellowstone national park the jackson hole region that's a that's a given we're also in one of the biggest energy producing parts of not just of wyoming but of north america here as well yeah we have farm and ranching here we have small business here we have conservation interests here yeah and, you know, and we're happy to engage all of those different um, you know groups of folks because 
at the end of the day, that's what the wildlife needs. It needs, you know, folks that are willing to group together, not on polarizing talking points, but to get together on the main talking points, like what can we do right now to impact the legacy and the heritage of wildlife in the state of Wyoming, you know? You found it has been determined just through the initial construction of these first few of the crossing projects, the results have been profound, haven't they? Absolutely. They're 80 to 90% effective immediately, Steve. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of win-win philosophy that the Wildlife Fund and the Wyoming Game and Fish Department are going to support wholeheartedly, along with YDOT as well. I mean, anything you have that good of a return on an investment, you know, it only makes sense to jump on board. So there's these two immediately that are that are right here. These are the first two of the state. Um, Highway 189, the South Kemmer 189 project, which will include a major overpass like this. Um, one of the other projects that's on the radar, it's US 26 up by Dubois, between Dubois and Crowhart. Well, there there will be an overpass there as well. And so there you have not only the deer, the amber, you have the bighorn sheep as well. Absolutely. The only reason the US 189 really took priority is because of the Wyoming Range mule deer herd and because of Terra Power's uh, nuclear plant construction. So um, there's estimates as high as 2,500 additional employees during the construction phase for that nuclear plant down near Kemmer. On a statewide basis, uh, I've seen a map where there have been dozens of places identified that would be, where it would be advantageous certainly to do this. Oh yeah. Is that part of the the longer vision of wildlife fund. It absolutely it. is, and it, you know it takes huge partnerships. Um, as you can imagine, they're not easy to, to fund. They're not easy to put in place. You know, we have a short construction season. Wyoming's a tough place to build, build high fence and exclusionary fencing and jump outs, and so you you have a short window to do them in. But um, I guess you know, from my perspective, the wildlife fund and the game and fish and YDOT are on a good course. Um, we're, you know, we're setting the bar high and, and just chiseling away at projects as we can and as we can obtain the, the kind of private funding partners that we need to make these a reality, Steve. Yeah, you start somewhere. Here's where we started. Look what we did. Yeah. And it proved that it's, it's possible to do and that it, the payoff is fantastic. Uh, we also want to, you know, showcase that these are a, a win for human safety. There's a lot of folks that travel to the state of Wyoming and get injured in wildlife accidents. I'm sure they didn't think that that would be a, a possibility. Here's what I remember about my, the first time I had this collision with the deer. It didn't really damage my car. The deer survived at least the collision. I don't mind saying I felt awful that yeah. it had happened. I, but the last thing in the world I wanted to do was to hit that. Yeah, the remorse and the, you know, the emotional, you know, it is, it's hard. You and I are both long time old time Wyoming residents, me a little older time than you. <laughs> We've seen what I think has been the worst winter overall in much of Wyoming and certainly in my lifetime. In the terms of, of how, of the duration of it, the relentlessness of it, the cold temperatures and the snow. Has that, and we, and we know coming out of that, the mortality numbers for pronghorn and mule deer in particular just been terrible. Does that affect the thinking or the progress or the concept of the Wildlife Crossing Project at all? Absolutely. Um, after this epic winter of 2022-23, it, it absolutely showcases how important these are because, you know, it makes that number 6,000 animals a year doesn't seem like that many in the broad scope of things until you start thinking about 80% mortality in adults. And there's definitely herds of pronghorn and herds of mule deer across the state, you know, in selective groups. I firmly believe we'll bounce back, but it might take a decade to do that, Steve. But this structure could help that happen. It's it actively will. helping that right now. It definitely is. And that's the thing is, you know, it, when you build a structure of this scope and of this magnitude, you know, you're in it for the long haul. And that's why research is so important and doing this right the first time. A lot of things that I've encountered in my, my news career that I had and my a television career that I'm having now, I ask myself, what are future generations going to think about what we did? And, I'll, and too often, I'm afraid, the question they're going to ask is, why in the world did you do that? Or why did you let that happen? Or why didn't you do this? 
I think this is something that future generations are going to look at and be proud of what we did. Absolutely, Steve. And I think, you know, one of the things that YDOT does well and, and some of these other entities, the Migration Initiative and folks like that is, you know, they're using technology to give people a glimpse of that. There's trail cams that you can get on. Um, if you look up Trappers Point Highway Crossings online, um, you can watch in real time you know, what these cameras are showing wildlife utilizing these resources. So it's so cool that we have technology to be able to shore up and back up the decisions we've made um, collectively as a group. And I think another thing I'd love to showcase about these that, you know, it's kind of an afterthought. We don't really have a lot of mortality or, or problems with people hitting small mammals, small predators, raccoons, badgers, all of those different things. But um, one of the things that's immediately obvious when you look at these webcams is you have bears and, and you know, mountain lions, bobcats, skunks, all sorts of wildlife that are utilizing these crossings that were built, not necessarily with them immediately in mind, but they um, use it too. But it's a secondary benefit. You're a Fremont County guy, you mentioned, you, uh, but you've lived, worked, been out of state, visited other places. Where does Wyoming, how does Wyoming stack up in the wildlife arena? Where do we rate? Well, in the lower 48, Steve, I think we're, you know, we're unmistakably at the apex of all of it. I mean, you know, the waters all start here. You know, you have the Rocky Mountains, um, Yellowstone National Park, one of the, you know, greatest, uh, you know, conservation ideas that it was ever known to man. I mean, they started the national park concept right here in Wyoming. Um, unbelievable groups of wildlife that migrate hundreds of miles across this state, um, many different large ungulates, birds, all types of species. And so it only makes sense that the Wyoming Game and, De and Fish Department and folks like the Wildlife Fund and some of these other great organizations and NGOs that we partner with work together to kind of set the bar for the, for the whole country and even for the world, I believe, because, you know, that's at the end of the day, the resource is, you know, it's only so much. There's only, you know, it's not an unlimited resource. We've noticed, you know, 40% decline in the Snowy Range and Wyoming Range mule deer herds, um, you know, for reasons all across the board, different biological reasons. Um, one thing we've identified is we know that killing does and fawns on the interstate and on the highway systems in our state has a, a tremendous impact.